Welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, joined by the head basketball coach, Mike Bray. Coach, it's been actually two weeks since we last talked in this environment. And since then, your team has gone four and one. You've been playing great basketball. You're at the top of the ACC standings. How have you assessed your team's performance over the last couple of weeks? Not a bad two weeks, huh, Tony? I just love our leadership. I love our mental toughness. I love our focus uh, to work through a jam-packed schedule because of re some rescheduling, mm -hmm. to absorb a punch that Duke gave us on a Monday night and bounce back with three more wins. Very proud of where we're at and we're leading the league and we're chasing a regular season championship. I wanna follow up on that. At this time, you are at the top of the ACC standings at 10 and three, a half game ahead of Duke. If we go back to Boston College on December 3rd, when you lost that first conference game on the road, I'm not sure anybody outside of the locker room thought that this position you're in right now was possible. How has your team been able to get there and how proud are you of them to be sitting at the top of the standings at this point in the year? Even some people inside that locker room were concerned about that. But, uh, you know, there's always been a real good senior leadership group of Hub, Leshevsky, and Goodwin. And I would add Cormac Ryan since he's been with us a while. Robbie Carmody as a leader, even though he's not playing. You know, that group kept pushing kept dreaming and I think felt there was a destiny to them after all they've been through in their younger years to be in the mix. When we went three and one in the league early, we started talking about why don't we chase a regular season championship? So now that's become daily talk. Coming up next, it's the Game Breakdown segment where we look back at all the men's basketball action. This is the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com. Now time for this week's game breakdown. Coach, we're going to start with the game all the way back a couple weeks ago against Virginia. When you think back to that, Virginia was coming in as a team you guys really had not had a lot of regular season success against. They're always really well coached, play a great, very uh, stingy style of defense. Approaching that game, what was your message to the team to get ready for them? Well, we, we, we definitely wanted to snap that streak. You know, Virginia's kind of owned us as they've had many teams in, in our league. And I thought we were really mentally prepared to play them. You know, it's a slow pace. They're a great defensive group, as, as you mentioned. I thought our defense, you know, was fabulous, guarding different kind of stuff. Our mixing in of zone helped us. And we were able, maybe for the first time in a while, to get into a little better offensive rhythm against Virginia's defense. Let's talk about some of the offensive performances in the first half. It was Blake Wesley with 10 points, Paul Atkinson with 12 that really paced you early. The two of them have played really well, I think, this year, and also in the first half. They seem to give you some nice juice to start the games. What did you see from them that put you in that position that let you execute the way you were talking about? Both of those guys being new to this whole Virginia thing, you know, uh, maybe there was no mental block, uh, and they just kind of played. But you're right, both both Blake and Paul have jump-started us many times offensively to start games. At halftime, you know, you play in Virginia. I just always am curious about what the message is in the locker room, because you were playing well in the first half, but you know that they're going to come and give you something in the second half. When you had that lead at halftime, what was the discussion like in the locker room? You know, I, I think our group is really mature to, to self-talk before I even get in there. 20 more minutes. we got to keep it up. How do we start the second half? Half. And in ACC play, as we've witnessed, you know, when you have leads, usually teams are going to make a run. Mm -hmm. And then are you poised enough to handle it and hold them off? And, and our group has shown they can do that, and we had to do that again against Virginia. In the second half, you did extend the lead to 15. Dane Goodwin came alive, Nate Leshesky. I, I thought the ball was moving really well. You mentioned the offensive execution, but specifically in the second half, seemed like the ball was just flowing for you guys. What did you like from the way your team was executing offensively in the second half that allowed you to extend that lead? Well, when we limit our dribbles, Tony, and, and you know what we've done with our offense, and we swing it to the second and third side, in other words, reverse the ball a couple times, we have learned that we can get some really good stuff. We also have a really good passing group. And when you have two big guys like Leshevsky and Atkinson who can pass, you know, it really helps your offense flow. You had 16 assists to eight turnovers, pretty good ratio for the team, two to one. But late in the game, Virginia does make it close. And we're gonna talk about it maybe a little bit later in Irish Intel. The one possession that stuck out to me was kind of that dagger three from Dane Goodwin at the right wing. It was when Blake Wesley went to the baseline, really an impressive pass along the end line to Hub who makes the extra pass. Talk me through that specific play and how that really illustrated the way your team moved the ball. You know, it was neat. That came out of the flow of our motion offense. That was not a play, it was not a set. 
it was a poised group of five guys being patient till they found something. Now, the one thing about Dane Goodwin, as we've seen this year, is he likes to go for the juggler and he wants to take the big shot. And you can't coach that. You know, either guys have that or they don't. And I know he sensed the moment, as he has many times, and pulled up and put it on him. Virginia did well to make it close late. Prentice Hub, though, came to the line and made a couple of clutch free throws. I get the sense, and I've seen it a couple times, when he's at the line late in games, his percentage on the year might not indicate it, but he seems money when the game counts most at the line. I think he's, it's been his career, you know, maybe not as good a free throw shooter as you'd want him to be overall, but when it's crunch time, uh, he wants the ball and he wants to make winning plays. And I don't think he's even hit any rim on his free throws. They've been pure net uh, in crunch time free throws throughout his career. You guys have broken a lot of streaks this year. You know, the Louisville game on the road, first win at the Yum Center in nearly seven years. You snapped a four, four year losing streak against NC State. This one against Virginia though, it felt like a real big moment for the program to just get that regular season win in the ACC out of the way. When you were in the locker room talking to the team after the game, what was the message about accomplishing what they did against Virginia? Yeah, I mean, it was a quick one because <laughs> we knew what was coming at us on Monday, but, but I think you know, for our older guys who've had a hard time against Virginia, you know, it was a moment, another confidence boost. You know, we've had many confidence boost kind of wins. You mentioned Louisville, getting NC State, and now getting NC State twice. You know, and, you know th those are all good for the psychology of our group and them feeling like they really belong. I think the most exciting thing about that win was that it gave you a ton of momentum going into the Monday night game against Duke. It was a quick turnaround, just a couple days, but there was a ton of juice in the building. You had a chance to play for first place in the conference on a huge national stage. Before we get to the game itself, I just want to know, because we talked before, what was it like to be in preparation mode for that game and have that team that you that you coach on that big stage in that moment? Well, the, the neat thing about that buildup, I mean, there was a buildup about it, there was hype about it, um, and, and, you know, maybe in a lot of ways it, it distracted us a little bit and put some pressure on us because now here it comes it, and 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 we kind of played that way I thought a little bit I thought our defense was good enough but man we weren't anywhere near who we could be offensively and you got to give Duke credit they came in and really guarded us but you know I, I've loved not only the, the Duke game, but our fans have really, and our student section, have really had our backs and help us believe in our building. Let's talk about the defense in that game because you held Duke to 57 points, and I think, to your point, it, it's something you can take your, away from that game and hang your hat on. What did you do defensively against one of the best teams in the country that enabled you to keep them under 60 points? You know, we've been consistent no matter who we played here in the last maybe month almost, and being able to stay in front of our guy. You know, we call it guarding your yard, guard your yard. You know, don't get beat by your guy so we're put in rotation mm -hmm. or helping recover. We've also been very good at taking away the three-point line. Our three-point percentage defense has much improved from last year, and, and that has helped keep teams scoring, you know, 60s in there, we feel most nights we can be efficient enough to get closer to 70 and, and, and get away from you. I want to ask what you learned from that Duke game too, because I think you look at the last couple of results, it's hard to not imagine that you took something away from that Duke game and it allowed you guys to go on this run you've gone on since then. So what was the big teaching point from that Duke game when you guys struggled to score offensively that you took down the road to Miami? I think it was what Prentice Hub said quickly after the game Monday night, very disappointed locker room, but we knew what we had coming at us two nights later in Miami. Prentice Hub jumped right up, you know, head up, bounce back bounce back in Miami, which is a phrase we've used in our program through the years. And when you have a group that has ownership and good leaders, you let them lead it, and certainly they did down in Miami. So the best guy to talk about as we transition to Miami is Dane Goodwin, because the Duke game was something we haven't seen from him all year. He wasn't in double figures, and on top of that, he was a goose egg. I mean, he just did not have it offensively against Duke. They played some great defense against him. We talked about him going into the Miami game. You were pretty confident this guy was gonna flush that one against Duke and come out and perform against Miami. He gave you 11 first half points against the Hurricanes. So what impressed you about Dane's bounce back? Knowing Dane as, a, as an older player and a veteran guy, uh, actually on Tuesday, we laughed about it, you know, and, and to loosen him up. And I said, look, you'll be back, relax. He said, I'm good coach. And, and again, he's a competitive dude. He's got an edge about him. And I was fully confident that he would get back in a rhythm and he did at Miami. 
you know, we've talked about all these different inflection points throughout the year when the season can go one way or the other. I think of Pitt and Georgia Tech on the road. A lot of them have really happened on the road. This game at Miami, when you look back at it now, you were coming in seven and three. They're eight and two. If you lose that game, you're two back of them and they've got the tie break. It's going to be a really uphill battle. So going into this one, you kind of knew it was a make or break game if you wanted to stay in the regular season conference title race. What was the message going into the game? Yeah, again, I think it was uh, the theme I, I talked to him about uh, on the sh at the shoot around on Wednesday was, you know, this would be the ultimate bounce back because mm -hmm. no one really thinks we can bounce back. You know, after getting punched like we did against Duke, you got a quick turnaround. Miami was waiting a couple days in preparation. Like th this would be the ultimate bounce back. And for them to do it and deliver like that, really proud of them. We'll talk about Paul Atkinson Jr. even more in the next couple of games. This is when I really saw him come alive against Miami. First half, he gave you 15 points, but again, seven of eight shooting. He's so efficient. He seemed to carry you a lot in the opening half. This is when Paul, I think, has really found his footing. What'd you see from him against Miami? Well, I think he was excited to play back home. A lot of family there, a lot of people there. Uh, the year before, we snuck him into the building and gave him a ticket. And he was sitting up in the rafters. You know, the next year he's the MVP. It's funny how that worked out. But, um, you know, I think his teammates really know he's in a rhythm and they're finding him. And, and he is going to work inside. I think now he's in better shape. He, you know, he had a whole year off last year. He's played his way into shape. I think Ryan Humphrey's done a great job mentoring on him on the bodies that are coming at you in this league you've never experienced before over and over again. So you need to be really physically and mentally ready. And I'm really pleased with how he has just jumped on it. It was 30-28 at halftime. I want to ask about a moment in the early portion of the second half. Miami came back. They had a little bit of a run. They had a two-point lead, and they, they took a three. And I remember thinking in my head, because the building was coming alive, if this three goes in, I think they're going to have to call timeout, settle it down. They missed the three, and you went on an 11-2 run after that to take the lead, and you never gave it up the rest of the way. I, I want to know, do you remember that sequence, and what in that sequence allowed your team to jump right back in front? I think that sequence has come up a lot with this group mm -hmm. and they their concentration goes up mm -hmm. their toughness goes up they feel the moment mm -hmm. like hey this is it right here and we've done this over and over again in second halves where you're up against the wall a little bit you're wondering and you buckle down and you get three or four stops mm -hmm. you get three or four real good offensive possessions and then all of a sudden the other team calls timeout Prentice Hub, we talked about his clutch free throws in the prior game. In this game, he got 13 points in the second half, 13 of his 15. To me, I always watch him. Seems like a lot of times he feels the game out in the opening half, maybe looking to set others up. Second half rolls around, he's ready to start letting it go. He knocked down three huge threes that really put some separation between you and the Hurricanes. What'd you like from Prentice? Well, I, I know he likes playing at Miami because the year before, I think he had 20-something. He played great. But you're right, I think Prentice has total control as the quarterback of our group and he's involving other people. His assist to turnover is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. But he also knows when we need him. Um, and nobody's hit a clutch, clutch bucket or you know, more clutch buckets, clutch threes, clutch free throws, key drives, key passes. He, is, um, he senses the moment and he wants the moment. And again, that's not something you can coach. That's something that a guy has. And right now, he is quarterbacking, and I'm listening to him as he quarterbacks. Miami, of course, made it close late, but again, I want to highlight one guy that we don't talk about a ton offensively who made some clutch free throws. That was Cormac Ryan, and we talk about him every week, I think, because of the defense, and he really deserves it on the defensive end, but he missed a couple free throws at Virginia Tech that I know he probably wasn't happy with himself about. Came back, knocked down some really clutch free throws for you against Miami to seal the victory. What does Cormac mean to this team? He, he means everything. You mentioned his defense and rebounding, and he's accepted a role, you know, coming off the bench. He's starting a little bit now with Leshevsky down, but, you know, he has completely embraced that, and he's given up some of his offense to do that. Now, in the midst of Leshevsky being down, it's funny how a season morphs and changes. He has gotten into a better offensive rhythm, and I think his decisions with the ball, you know, finding people have really improved. And I think right now we're on a run where Cormac Ryan is doing this on both ends of the floor now and such a key guy for us. You get the win to move to eight and three. And at that point, you're tied with Miami in the ACC. Now you know you're really alive for the conference regular season title. After the game, just what was your takeaway and message to the team? Well, they were really excited. And I, and I wanted to reiterate, you know, 
it just shows the kind of character you have to be able to bounce back in a short window after a tough night on Monday. And I said, now, if you really want to have character, we get this other one before we go home, and darn if we didn't. Coach, we'll talk about that one after a break on the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireAct.com. Now time to continue this week's game breakdown with the coach, Mike Bray. Let's look at last week's games. First, NC State, you go on the road to Raleigh. This is the first time you played a team for the second time in a season this year. So I'm always curious, when you're preparing for a team that's already seen you, what do you have to be mindful of going into that situation? You know, you, you, you try not to overanalyze. You watch a little bit of your game before and what helped you. But you also know you, know, you got to be ready for a little bit of everything and teams change. And I thought, you know, we were able to get some rest in Miami on Thursday, roll into Raleigh on Friday, tune it up a little bit, and we get off to a great start. We were very ready to play. Let's talk about that start. You guys went up 19-3. to I think you held uh, NC State to one of their first 13 from the floor. We've talked about defense, but now we can really focus on it. The last six games, you've held opponents to 65 points or less. The start defensively against NC State was fabulous. What were you seeing on the defensive end? Just great position. Um, great help, great blockouts, one and done. And what it helped us do for the first time to start a game, we had so many stops in a row, we were able to run. Mm. And we were able to get down the floor, and we got easy buckets early in transition. And, you know, and, and our tempo overall is a little slower, but that doesn't mean when we get a defensive rebound and we have a numbers advantage, we don't want to take advantage. But it, it kept coming up over and over again, and you know, probably the best game defensively we've started. I want to ask one follow-up about rebounding because every time I get to a gym and watch this team take the floor, I look on the other side and I see, man, this team's size, it would suggest that they're going to get out-rebounded. And you guys have rebounded really well the entire year against some really good rebounding teams. So talk to me about how your team rebounds as a team because you've mentioned Cormac Ryan will fly in for seven rebounds in a game. Your guards hit the glass. Well, it seems like a real team effort, but I want to know how do they get it done? Yeah, I think our guard rebounding, starting with the Kentucky game where we made that a big emphasis, has helped us. But Leshevsky and Atkinson together really do a good job controlling the backboard, especially the last seven, eight minutes of a game. They're really good at knowing now we got to get every miss and people can't get putbacks. Of course, Paul's been a little bit on his own here the last two, uh, and he's done a yeoman's job getting 15 rebounds the other night against Louisville. Let's ask, or let's talk about when you lost Nate Leshevsky. He goes out after just five minutes with that lower leg contusion. So you know you're down to six normal rotation players. I imagine you found out at some point in the first half, maybe at halftime, you wouldn't have him the rest of the way. When you get that kind of news, what's the discussion like amongst the coaching staff, amongst the players to know how you're going to adjust mid-game when you weren't planning on not having his services? You know, you, you kind of, you, you, you just kind of, as the leader, say, hey, Nate's not coming back. We got enough to win it. Let's go. Here we go. And then for a guy like guys like Trey Wirtz and Cormac Ryan, all of a sudden their eyes get a little bit bigger because they know, well, I got to start the second half and I'm going to play more minutes. And I thought both of them, Trey and Cormac, were fabulous without, you know, not having Nate. They knew they had to up it. This might have been Trey Wirtz's best game. He matched a season high with 12 points just like he had against Kentucky. He's somebody that when he comes on the floor, even if the numbers don't pop, he's a sound presence for you. He always, you, you always kind of know what kind of uh, composure he's going to have on the floor. In this game specifically, how rewarding was it to see him go off for 12 points? Well, you know, he can make open shots. He's really good with the ball. He, you know, his assist to turnover is fabulous. He steadies you a little bit on the offensive end, and he's much improved defensively. That's an area where we've really challenged him. He's gotten better there. Uh, but he has the ability to score. He's a 1,000-point scorer over his college career. He's, I, I give him a lot of credit. He's sacrificed some with this group to play a different role, yet he's doing it, and, and I have a lot of respect for that. I always want to know about the timeout conversation. So let's talk second half. You had this huge lead, 17 point lead in the first half. To NC State's credit, they come back and they take ultimately a 40 to 37 lead. The timeout though you took was at 38, 37. And from that point, you went on another great run out of the timeout. So what was the discussion? And then the key that you saw, because Blake got a couple of big baskets, Trey hit the three. What was the result of that timeout? Well, it's it's a little bit of a recording almost now because it's (laughs) happened over and over again where I say, fellas, Let's relax. We weren't gonna, we're not gonna win an ACC game by 20 on the road. Everybody calm down. 
Here's the game situation. Let's come out, all right? Let's, let's get a little more focused. We need great possessions offensively. And how about a kill? A kill is three stops in a row. How about we put that together with a, a kill with great offensive possessions? We good, everybody good? And, and, and again, this older group's like, yeah, been here, done that. And get out, go, I don't wanna talk anymore. <laughs> Those sound like fun huddles to be a part of. Maybe someday I'll be in there. The, the, the team then, as you said, played some outstanding defense, but it was the zone. And we've talked about the zone throughout the year. You really implemented it deep in the second half against NC State, and they seemed lost. And again, it's an NC State team that has the most prolific scoring trio in the conference. So it's not as if they don't know how to score the basketball. What were the keys you were seeing from your zone late that really seemed to take them out of their game? What's helped us this year with how we're playing our zone is we can play it wider and we can get out the three-point threats instead of playing it tighter. And, and again, we, we, we changed that. Uh, Anthony Weish has been a big part of that. Uh, and we're wider, uh, and so we were aware of the three-point threats, but we also do a good job now. We're starting to get deflections in it, and we're starting to get people to take maybe some bad shots against it, and then we're rebounding out of one and done. A lot of times, too, zone helps our offense. It kind of calms us a little bit, and we're able to run out of it. It helps us offensively. It can buy you some time physically because you're not chasing ball screens and running over stuff. You're, you know, and, and, a, and a team on offense now has to put the ball over their head a little bit. And there's a lot of guards that want to keep doing this and not do that for, let's say, five straight possessions. So you guys get the win by 12 points. You guys have played a lot of close games on the road. Now you get one where you can kind of breathe at the end a little bit, a double digit win on the road to get to nine and three. Just how satisfying was it? Because you said, hey, if we bounce back against Miami, I want you guys to validate it down here in Raleigh. And they, they did more than that. I mean, they really stamped that one. I, I just think it's such great ownership and leadership and a group that feels it's their time. Like we are gonna go up there and we still have business to handle on the road. They're a very confident road team anyways. And, you know, when it gets heated on the road and the crowd gets on us and we lose a lead or we're down, we almost relish this right now to be able to make a run and quiet a crowd. It's, it's really cool to be around. So it was a great road trip. You win both games, you're nine and three. Then I'm sure you, whether you're watching online or you're watching on the phone, you saw Monday night's result where Virginia beats Duke at Cameron. So now you wake up knowing, okay, on Wednesday, when Louisville comes to town, if we win, we're gonna be at the top of the standings. If only for a day, maybe it'll be longer, who knows, but you have a chance to have first place by yourself. Did that give you any added emphasis going into the game against Louisville on Wednesday? Well, when Beekman's shot went in against Duke, I'm thinking to myself, man, our karma is pretty good right now. The, the skies are opening, the seas are parting. Let's see if we can take advantage. And you know, we knew we had a bit of a wounded Louisville team coming in with all the changes they've had and a suspension and a, and a guy back in the lineup. Uh, but Louisville still has personnel. People need to, and they've got 10 bodies that can really come at you. Um, and, and they did. <laughs> they got 10 guys, like you said, that can score between five and 10 points. You guys, though, I thought did a great job in the opening half. Somebody we haven't talked about in the span of the 4-1 run you guys are on is Blake Wesley. He hasn't had the maybe most efficient offensive performance, but I thought in the first half against Louisville, he led you in scoring with nine points, back to his old ways, four of six, had that great back down where he really took advantage of a mismatch. The Blake we saw in the first half against Louisville feels like the guy we're gonna maybe see going towards the postseason. Yeah, and, and again, I think, I think he's still been really playing well for us um, you know okay he didn't score 22 he didn't score 23 but I think his shot selection has been better so his percentages are better and he's been able to get in the lane and find people and get to the basket and get fouled and, and I think especially to start a game that's been my mess just don't settle for jump shots that doesn't mean you don't take great shots right. from three but you don't need to settle don't, don't put, keep pressure on people where after some movement, I thought he drove closeouts. When he drives closeouts, you, you, you gotta foul him. You can't guard him. 35-23 at halftime. I thought Louisville looked all out of sorts in the first half. I think they took 60% of their shots from three against a lot of zone. In the second half, they came back at you. And I think they deserve a ton of credit because they have a ton of reasons to fold the tent, right? And they'd lost five in a row. They come back and they take a lead. I mean, what did you see that allowed them to get back in the game? And then let's talk about the timeout you took when you had another conversation. Well, they're, you know, they're, they physically have the ability to drive you, like a lot of people. The scouting report is going to drive them, drive them. They're not the most physical team. Play one-on-one -on -one and then go beat them up on the backboard. And they had that recipe going during that comeback. You know, they're backing us down. 
we're afraid to trap and rotate because we don't want to give up three-point shots. You know, those count too. And we feel we can absorb those. And, and we feel we can be more efficient, even though when, you know, three in a row go in from the lane, you go, should we do something different? We did play maybe one possession of zone, but we felt we had to have bodies on people. And they just kind of beat us up physically. I thought we got great looks during that stretch on the offensive end. We, we, we didn't make any yeah. to kind of give you any breathing room. So now you got game pressure on you. And this group has had game pressure on itself at home, on the road. I, I think they're addicted to it. They love it. it it's, it's an addiction. And, and I'm, I've learned to work with it. Um, but we call timeout. We're down one. And, you know, I said, fellas, we haven't been here before. And, you know, Prentice goes, Coach, we're, yeah, we're down one. We're fine. We're fine. I think we are, too. You know the recipe. Come on. How about we guard? Can we block out when we get a defensive rebound, squeeze it with two hands? I thought we had some great, smart offensive possessions mm -hmm. during that run, too. Trey Wirtz's drive after some movement, just all coming within the flow. And then Atkinson started getting every rebound. Yeah, Atkinson did a great job. 17 points, 15 rebounds after a week in which he was named ACC Player of the Week. And he went into the game knowing he wasn't going to have the help of Nate Leshesky, who you said does a lot of work on the glass. So to see him just, I guess, just pick up the slack on his own, what did that mean to you? Yeah, I think, I think he knew we needed him. And he also, we, he knew I was going to play him 37 <laughs> minutes. And he's in shape to do that more now. I don't know if I want to do 37 all the time, but he, I may need to do it one more time here on Clemson before we get Nate back. Um, he physically can do that. And, and, uh, and I think he knew, like, I'm going to have to get every one of them because Nate's not back there with me. Let's talk about the basket you just mentioned a little bit earlier, too. Trey Wirtz, who we said in NC State, gave you a nice performance. Again, he comes on the floor, plays some crunch time minutes for you, and goes and gets a huge basket that ultimately was kind of the game-winning basket in the end. It broke the tie and gave you the lead the rest of the way. He, he's a veteran guy. He knows how to play. He has a great feel for our system. I thought some of his post feeds to Paul were key mm -hmm. throughout. He was the guy getting the ball to Paul at key times throughout the game. But that was so natural where we moved it. And he is a big, you know, he, he is not afraid of the moment. As we know, he threw one in at the buzzer against Wake Forest last year. So when he started the drive on the closeout, I'm saying this is just all part of the recipe. And he finishes, and then we have some confidence, and we start to defend a little better. Let me ask you about one more person, that's Prentice Hub makes the big three that's kind of the dagger of the game. But I have to say, I would say it to his face too. The first five threes he took, they weren't just misses. Yeah. They, were, they were way off. And then again, the game gets late, step back, knocks down the three as if he was five for five instead of 0 for five. What does that tell you about his psyche? That, that's who he is. And, and I think I, I've, I learned to ride that early. <laughs> Our fans have kind of now learned to ride that a little bit better. And my two new coaches have too, because they were pulling their hair. And I said, just... Hang in there, we'll calm them down. But I'm telling you, the last five minutes of the game, you're gonna want him. And uh, he has a short memory, thank God. The, the defense is the story. I wanna ask one more question about it. At 6.14 in the game, you gave up a basket, and then the rest of the way, only one more basket in the final six minutes and 14 seconds. You've emphasized defense since the summer. It's six straight games with 65 points or less, which didn't look likely when they were rolling there in the second half. Your team managed to turn it on. Just the identity of this team being defensive, especially late in games, this week against NC State and Louisville, what does that mean when it's really sinking in with the team and it's then showing the results? I, I'm thrilled that they embraced it. It started last spring. You see all the lines we have still on our court that are our defensive principles, and they've really embraced that. Certainly Anthony Solomon came in and as kind of our D coordinator, and I turned him loose on him. They know they can do that. They know they can get stops at key times. And that's a bit of a change in mentality, especially for these older guys. We talked about it at the start of the show, but to be at 10 and three, we talked about it last night after the game as well. At the top of the standings for a team that's seen a lot of adversity, not just this year, but in prior years, what does that mean as a coach? Uh, you know, it's really neat. I, I was mentioned to somebody, you know, Hub, Leshevsky, Goodwin, Carmody, when they were freshmen, they finished 15th in the league. You know, now there was three one seeds in the league that year, but we invested in the young guys. They finished last. And for them to wake up uh, this week and see the top of the standings, eh, that's kind of cool for them. I hope they feel accomplished because they have been so coachable. They have been great kids and they've chased this together. Coach, appreciate it. We'll step aside and come back with more on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com.
Now time for this week's edition of Irish Intel. Coach, when you look at this play here against Virginia, you're up six. Dane Goodwin's going to knock down a three that really puts the game away at this point, but it starts with some great ball movement from your team. Well, we're just good with the ball, and I think we sense big possessions. You know, Paul Atkinson is very good with the ball right here because they're pressuring him, and he's smart with it. Nate's been good with it, too. And this is just a heck of a drive. And to be able to throw that left-handed around the defense, extra pass by Prentice, dagger by that guy who, you know, senses the moment. Uh, again, a, a mature group that understands the moment and understands we have to get a great one right here. And if we do, we put it away. I mean, there's only maybe one guy that can make that pass, left-handed around. Hub picks up a grounder, flips it underhanded, and then Dane with great poise here to get the guy in the air and kind of confidently sidestep and kick it in, and our bench is awesome over there. You, you mentioned the pass. I just want to follow up. This pass from Blake Wesley, yeah. how difficult is this? This is his offhand. He's going to pump fake, go around along the end line. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a next-level pass that might go under the radar. Well, I mean, you know, he does it lefty. And again, because he has wingspan, he can get it around everybody. He made one of those the other night, too, uh, uh, against Louisville, you know, where he just wraps it lefty around. And for Hub to pick this one up and know where the ball needs to go, you know, he gets to ground. That's like a shortstop right there, <laughs> right? He pitches it for the double play almost, right? And then, you know, Dane knows, I, I need to put this away. And just really calm and knowing who we are and understanding who we are and, um, you know, a lot of mental toughness with this group that's just so fun to be around. So, Coach, this is in the final minute of the first half against NC State. You guys got off to a great start in this game. We're up 19-3 in the opening half. The offense is working for you. This is some great ball movement by your team. Just great reads here out of the framework of our motion offense. You know, our bigs handling the ball up top with Paul. Great look by uh, Prentice, the extra pass calm with a shot fake and we get it that that's just there's just real good poise and calm feet through that possession this is a great angle by the way to see it but look at the rate of the ball screen we've got great spacing on the on the left side of the floor great spacing Prentice here and instead of Paul going into all that traffic and maybe charging this is the kind of play he's made that's a great pass mm -hmm you know, over the top right there. Just a big time pass. And then watch Cormac's calm feet to attack the closeout. I'm gonna get you up in the air. I'm gonna take one dribble. Prentice is really feeling, you see his hand up. He's feeling the spacing. We've got good spacing with Dane and Trey as well. And just, that's going in because the possession was so good. Like when we have good possessions, and we move it like that, I bet you, you know, you make 90% of those. Just beautiful basketball, playing together, sharing the ball, a group that really can pass the ball together. All right, Coach, this last play is against Louisville. Late in the first half, you guys were really playing well in the first half. Blake Wesley's going to actually take the ball in a position we haven't seen him do too much work this year, but he had a big size advantage. He went back, back down to the post to get an easy basket. And you know what was great about this possession? Prentice was telling him to go. You know, Prentice is telling him, go. We had a timeout. I was like, you know, we're not going to use it. Then all of a sudden we get into this. We had one of these at Louisville where he's backing a shorter guard down. They don't really come and help. That's a heck of a tough shot. And, uh, you know, again, it was his teammates, especially Prentice, go, take him, take him. You've talked about it this year. The, the veterans are, are really coaching him on when to go use his size and athleticism to his advantage. How valuable is that to have the, the veterans say, hey, go do your thing? I think he's really confident because these old guys have, older guys have told him, but this is really good feel. They're not really doubling. They don't want to double. And, and you know, he feels a shorter guy. That's a heck of a tough shot, but he gets his shoulders square, he gets a release, and that's a good call. You know, you can't come under a shooter right there. So we ended up getting something at the end of the half, and it's not really something that's in our framework, but it may be going forward because that looked pretty good. Is that a two for one where you go there to try to get it with 36 on the clock? Is the timing what you want to see? You know, it, it was a little slower. Prentice was telling him two for one, okay. but then as it got, and we've talked about this, if it doesn't happen quick, then let's just calm down and get something good. And I, I think this is something good, you know, to have a 10-footer there. We had a chance for a three-point play. He missed the free throw, but, you know, um, you know we've, uh, I've tried not to overcoach two-for-ones because sometimes I think we rush 
And, you know, we've kind of, we're so efficient offensively, let's just get a good possession. That does it for this week's edition of Irish Intel. When we come back, we'll have Irishography on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com. So, Robbie, the team's playing really well this year. You guys are at the top of the ACC standings as we speak right now. Just from your vantage point, what has been the biggest key to the success this season? I think we've just been playing more within ourselves compared to the last couple of years. Um, we kind of just have a certain trust level with each other from being here for so long that we know that a guy is going to be able to go out and do what we need him to do no matter what. And that's, that makes it easy to play and work in your role. So. I want to ask you about your role because you've been injured the last couple of years and have not been able to make it on the floor. So from your standpoint, how do you stay engaged and what kind of role do you serve for this team on the sidelines? Uh, I see myself as a little bit of a leader on the sidelines. Um, I try and make sure that everyone on the bench is staying engaged because I know how hard it can be to uh, stay, stay locked in in games when you're not playing all the time. So um, you can see me after TV timeouts and stuff going by and giving everybody on the everybody on the sideline knuckles, just making sure that they're locked in and they're they're with us because we need all 14 guys to win games in the ACC. What do you do to try to get the, the bench engaged then? Like, what is the message? How do you try to activate them? Because you said it's only five guys can play at once. I know you're in a, s a situation where you know you're not going to go in, but guys might not be getting the minutes they want. So what's the message like when you maybe see somebody that isn't getting the minutes they want? It's just it, the, t the time to the time to worry about that stuff is in practice when when you can you can work and you can go against those guys and try and prove that um, you deserve to be out there. Um, when we're when we're in the games, we need everybody locked in and focused on winning and supporting each other, no matter what's going on outside of outside of basketball. I was talking to Coach Bray earlier, and he mentioned that the senior class that consists of you, Dane, Nate, and Prentice that all came in together is now in first in the ACC. There's a real sense of accomplishment that you guys came in together as freshmen and are now at the top of the standings. Just what has it meant to see your group succeed the way you have this year? Uh, it's it's meant a lot. Um, we've kind of been dogged on a little bit the past couple years and coming out and just having that confidence that we're going to win every game because we've put in the time and we've put in the work to do that is it's really cool to see all of our hard work come to fruition almost and then you have the guys that have come in like Paul and Blake who've only been here for one year but have really bought into to the stuff that we're trying to sell to them and I think you can really see that on the court by the way that we play together. You've been in uniform the last couple of practices. It's been nice to see you out there on the floor after not being there at the beginning of the year. Just, I want to know, an update from you. Where do you stand uh, with your health and how are things feeling as you get back on the floor a little bit? Things have been feeling great. Um, these past couple weeks, we haven't had any setbacks. I've been able to put some consecutive days together, which has been a really big step for me. Um, but moving forward, we kind of just are doing things a day at a time because what, what the stuff that I've been going through with my knee is kind of unprecedented for most of us. So we just deal with, deal with things as they come and one day I'll get cleared and that'll be that. One thing I want to ask, because we've talked about it in the past individually about what it's been like to go through some of these injuries. And that was prior to another injury you've had. I just want to know from your standpoint, what's the toughest part about going through the injury circumstances you have the last couple seasons? I would say the toughest part is just kind of thinking you get in that mindset that like you're letting your teammates and your coaches down um that's probably been the hardest thing for me but I mean I couldn't I couldn't ask for a better a better group of guys a better a better coaching staff I know that no matter what happens they're gonna have my back and I have theirs so who's somebody over the course of the last four years then that's been really helpful when you've had some tough times whether it's a teammate a coach it could be someone not even on the roster someone in the Notre Dame community just who's been someone that's been extremely helpful to you during this time I would say Nixon and T Rowe um, I spend hours every day with them getting getting work getting treatment and they kind of have a pulse on how I'm feeling every day so um, if I'm feeling down though they'll, they'll make sure that they're they're getting checking in with me texting me make sure that I'm doing okay and I I like as weird as it is, I, I wouldn't change any of my injuries for the world because it's, it's really showed me um, the, the people that I can trust and who are going to have my back through everything. Let's go back a few years to then when you were deciding to make the decision to come to Notre Dame. As you were making the assessment where you wanted to go to school and play basketball, why did you ultimately land on Notre Dame? I picked Notre Dame because of the, the way that the coaching staff portrayed the family atmosphere about the program. Um, 
I come from a high school program where like second through 12th grade where we're all in the gym together working and I kind of wanted something where it felt like you were putting years on years together mm -hmm. and you get that here you get the guy the older guys coming in and checking in with you making sure you're okay and then I kind of have the opportunity to do that now with the younger guys that are coming in and I just think that the family atmosphere around this place is really special and it's really shown throughout my injuries. I know you haven't played as much as you'd want in your career to this point, but I just want to know, now that you've been at Notre Dame, this is your fourth year on campus, just what has the impact of this place been on you? I, I can't even state it. I mean, I say it all the time. I think that Notre Dame has really shaped me into a, a much better person than I was prior to being here. I think I've learned and grown and just become an all around nicer person. One more I have is you guys are 10 and three. We've talked about it in first place in the conference, seven games left in the regular season. What do you think the biggest key is going to be to finishing this regular season the right way? I think it's just going to be taking it one game at a time and uh, making sure we don't look ahead and try and worry about things to come. Um, the ACC stuff is, it's really rough and you gotta, you gotta really focus on every game. And if you get, if you get ahead of yourself, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle. Robbie, appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thank you. That does it for this week's Irishography. When we come back, we'll look ahead on the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireAct.com. It's now time to wrap up this week's show. Coach, you got another big road trip coming up. You're going down to Clemson for a game, and then you get a chance for some revenge back here at home against Boston College. What's the key going to be going into this next week? Well, I, th I think our guys like playing on the road, so they're going to be excited about playing in an ACC road atmosphere at Clemson. Uh, a team that's really gifted offensively that we did a good job defending first game. And by the time BC gets here, you know, we certainly have some memories of early December, which was, uh, quite frankly, a low point for us. We really reacted. We're a lot different than we were that night, but let's see if we can get them. We've talked about it throughout the show a bunch, but I just want to talk about it again. You guys are 10-3. and three. You're at the top of the conference. You are in the mix for the regular season uh, title in the ACC. As a coach, just how much fun is this right now? I'm, I'm really enjoying being around this group and seeing how they've grown, how they've led, how they've, how they've taken ownership of themselves to chase this. Again, as young guys, we invested in them. And uh, to win a regular season title with this group may be one of the most gratifying things in my coaching career to watch them do it. Coach, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks. That does it for this week's Mike Bray Show presented by TireAct.com.